chapter 16, and we'll actually be in three of the Gospels this evening, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, kind of looking at some of the uh, same passages, and from, of course, a different Gospel writer perspective. And I want to answer the question this evening, uh, or just want to uh, deal with the topic tonight, the subject of avoiding death, avoiding death. And I hope it's an interesting one for you. I think most of the world, in um, different, various ways, are trying to avoid dying. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's always fun for me to watch trends, especially health trends. How many watch health trends? And uh, I think, is it, is, it a, um, is it a commercial right now? I don't know if I saw it on a, on a, online or somewhere, but there's a commercial right now where a guy is in front of a, a butcher's um, part of a meat department, and he's saying, I want this and this and this and this and this. And his friend says, aren't you vegan? And he, what did he say? I'm a, um, I can't remember the, the term that he used for it, but it's something like a, some type of vegan. Anyway, the point was that, uh, you know, it's, a few years ago, being vegan was everything, and now keto. You know, you got to be keto, and, uh, and uh, if, it's, it's interesting as well, the, the supplements that are the trends. You know, a couple of years ago, it was like flaxseed oil. And then a few years before that, you remember the, uh, what was the berry, the acai berry? was like the big one is going to save everybody's life. And, and uh, now the essential oils say, I think the essential oil thing is phasing out. It, it is. Um, which is really sad because I just love, I love to make fun of essential oil. <coughs> and uh, I really am going to miss it when it's gone. I, and I'll pray for it to come again soon, uh, honestly. Because when I was growing up, bran, bran was like the stuff. I mean, uh, Lester Roloff used to preach about bran, you know, and, and about uh, almonds and nuts and things like that, so those were the things. And, uh, my, my point in saying that this evening is I'm being a little bit silly. I, I, I do enjoy making fun of uh, things that people do, but honestly, the truth is, is that most people are trying to preserve their life. They're trying to live longer, and uh, they, they joke about old Lester Roloff that if he hadn't died in an airplane crash, uh, that's the way the Lord had taken him because he was so healthy he would never die otherwise. <laughs> 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 uh, health crazy and so forth, but anyway, all right. Well, uh, I want to deal with the subject tonight, and it's, it really is a subject matter that I think lost people are certainly more focused on than saved people. I don't want to talk about death this evening. I want to look at it in, in context, not in, a, in some kind of a crude context or anything like that. But I want to look at a particular phrase that I think most of us uh, would read and say, what does that mean? And so we'll see it in our context. Look down to verse 24, will you please, in Matthew chapter 16. Uh, This is after he's told his disciples he's going to die. Peter's rebuked him. He's rebuked Peter. And then in verse 24, Then said Jesus unto his, notice that next word, the audience he's speaking to, disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Well, let's pray and let's ask the Lord's help, and we'll analyze that last verse because I think that raises a lot of questions for us, doesn't it? So let's go to the Lord. God, I pray that you would help us with our understanding. Father, this evening I do not pretend to uh, be able to have all the answers, but I do think that any time there is something in your word that causes us to ask a question, then there's something for us to learn and something that we can practically apply. I pray we'll find it this evening. In your word we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, that last verse, verse 28, kind of gets my attention. Of course, this is a dramatic statement, <laughs> dramatic text. This is uh, one of the key passages on discipleship. By the way, Jesus isn't explaining how to be saved. He's talking about how to be a disciple. He's not addressing the Pharisees and the scribes. He's not addressing unbelievers. He's addressing his disciples, one of whom would have been an unbeliever. And certainly, I think that the Scripture does not here indicate necessarily that Jesus is only addressing the twelve. He may have been addressing more disciples than just the twelve, but he certainly would have been addressing specifically the twelve. 
You do know that there's a difference between being a disciple and being an apostle. A disciple is the one who's a learner or a follower. And Jesus had many disciples, but many of his disciples went away. Many of his disciples went back from following him. Until the cross itself, uh, the twelve did not go away, did not go back from following Jesus, and of course John didn't. Okay, so let's uh, continue. Let's look at this, I guess, in all, all four of the Gospels. Uh, in, in Mark, if you would please go down to Mark in chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. And uh, look at, let's, actually I meant to say chapter 8. We'll, we'll be in chapter 9 is the verse we want. But chapter 8 and verse 34. I'm going to be moving along. If you can't guess, I'm going to go to Luke after Mark, so just be ready. Ready? Verse 34, Mark chapter 8. And when he had called the people unto him with, it, with his disciples also. And so it seems that like the context I was talking about earlier. I think that this would not be the Pharisees and scribes. This would be followers of Jesus. He said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. In chapter 9, verse 1, he said unto them, Verily or truly I say unto you that there be some that stand, of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Well, that seems to indicate uh, the same thing that it was in Matthew chapter uh, 16, doesn't it? All right, you, are you in Luke yet? Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. And then verse 23. Again, same context. Jesus has told his disciples that he's going to die. He's going to go to the cross, be raised again the third day, according to Luke. Verse 23, And he said unto, said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall, will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? That's a good way of uh, helping us to understand particularly what, uh, what Jesus was saying. It, it, the, 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 the additional phrasing, I think, is, is a real help. Luke's, Luke's perspective on it here. Verse 26, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, uh, when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. Well, again, that same passage, would you, would you guess which where we're going to go next? John, chapter 8. John, chapter 8. And uh, this, of course, John is, uh, not, does not write as a synoptic gospel. Or, I'm sorry, does not write the, the gospels the same ways. Um, but I want to read verse 52 of John chapter 8, and I think that it'll help us. Matter of fact, we, may, we perhaps will be back here uh, if we have time. Then saith the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And thou sayest, If a man keep my sayings, he shall never taste of death. Now there's a key there, and I'm going to hold a marker in John, but I want to go back to Matthew chapter 16, if you will, please. And I just want to answer the question uh, that a lot of you have. And I think that perhaps I'd better take a minute and talk about some uh, some misnomers or false teaching about not only the gospel, since we've looked at them in a, a synoptic sense this evening. In other words, we've looked at them, you know, as a synopsis where three of the gospel writers are giving the exact same account. And uh, they're actually giving it in the same order. And there are a lot of things that people teach that try to cast aspersion or doubt on the Word of God, try to make people doubt the Word of God. One of those uh, teachings is the whole Q document gospel. And if you haven't heard of it, you don't know what I'm talking about. 
I'm glad you have it, and, it, and it, hopefully you don't run into it. But the Q document would be what is thought to be the original gospel that the other gospel writers copied for their own perspective. And I just want to address that just briefly here this evening because I think it's a help for us as believers. You know, when someone makes a statement like that, for instance, there is an Adventures in Odyssey that you can listen to where they're talking about text, and they refer to the Q document, the one that was the original, that the gospel writers copied from so that they could get their story together. And with that, uh, what the underlying teaching behind that is, is to say, you know what, these guys got their story together on the gospel. In other words, they had to consult each other and copy each other to make sure they told the same story. And that's because, you know, they didn't have their own account. And what they're trying to say is that the Bible isn't inspired and preserved. It's a man-written, man-made book, and it has error. And uh, let me just, just mention that. First of all, let me just say a couple of things. The, the gospel writers knew one another. The gospel writers knew one another, and if you think that they didn't get back together and uh, say, you know, Jesus told us that we're supposed to teach people to observe all things, what service commanded us. What did he command us? I think maybe they had some conversations about some conversations they'd had with Jesus together. As believers, oh, I think so. I can imagine John saying, you remember when Jesus told us and we didn't believe that he was going to die? Or not John saying that, but uh, you know, uh, Luke saying that, or Peter saying that. You, Peter saying, yeah. Boy, I got that one. Uh, you know, I, I heard it about, you know, when I said, far be it from thee, Lord. And he called, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. You know, and uh, man, I tell you what, <laughs> whew, I got it for that one. I sure remember that really well. And I can imagine that the, that the disciples, after the conversation with Jesus, almost every time Jesus taught his disciples, particularly when he used a parable uh, to illustrate truth, generally speaking, when Jesus taught his disciples, they conversed about it afterward. And so small wonder that their accounts were orderly and small wonder that their accounts were the same. You know, I found out that I'm a liar when I give eyewitness accounts for things. You ever see somebody commit a crime and try to describe the person afterward? I'm a liar. <laughs> One time I described a, a guy's coat as red and it was orange. I described a guy's height one time I was wrong about it. Just you know, I just don't do a very good job. Uh, I don't do a very good job seeing all the details, especially when there's adrenaline or something like that going on. Uh, I'm bad about facial recognition anyway. I just uh, I, I recognize faces, but I don't know where they're from, <laughs> you know. And if somebody commits a crime and you were to have me draw the you know one of those sketches where you describe what the person looks like, it would look nothing like the person. I promise you, it would just look like somebody else altogether. Does that mean I didn't see the person, or if I actually saw the actual person, that it's not them, or that it is them? No. Um, the fact is, is that uh, sometimes it's a helpful to sit down with someone else that was there, talk about something, and then you go, "Oh yeah," and you relive it, and you and you get, you do get your story together. Now, I'm not saying the God that the gospel writers, you know colluded in writing their Gospels. Each of them saw the need to write their Gospel. First of all, prompted by the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. They also saw a need to write a Gospel from a perspective. In other words, each of them had a perspective in penning the Gospel. And we certainly know as we're in John on Sundays now, we know that John's Gospel was very, very different from the synoptic Gospels from the other three. He didn't tell the same stories, didn't share the same miracles. The miracles that John showed were the most extreme of the miracles. And the reason for that is because he was saying, these things have written it to you that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. His purpose was so that people could believe that Jesus is the Christ. The other gospel writers were saying this is who Jesus was. Matthew, of course, Jesus is king of the Jews, and we could go through each of the gospels and talk about the way that Jesus Christ is presented, the Son of Man, the suffering servant, and so forth. But the point is this evening, I want you to know that the Holy Spirit of God used these, used these individuals. And it's very unique when you get to a place where each of the discussions or conversations follow the same flow like they do here. In other words, a lot of times their, their order of events or the sharing of the events is not in the same order in the Gospels. And so it's almost like if you read Matthew and then you read Mark and you read Luke, it's like you just read the same thing with a few variations of words, which do help with perspective, don't they? Give us just a little bit of a perspective about it. 
Uh, discipleship. It's always important to point out for people that try to make discipleship the gospel instead of believing in Jesus the gospel. Because we're not saved by following Jesus. We're saved by believing in Jesus. Jesus is not talking about how to be born. You say, well, pastor, they're talking about who should lose his life and save his life. Exactly. That's what we're talking about this evening. See, what a lot of people are doing is trying to keep this life. Isn't it so? In other words, you know, I find that as believers, oftentimes we're trying to hold on to this life, aren't we? Sometimes I sit down and I just ponder the nonsense of how much I don't want to die. and just think how foolish it is that I don't want to die because nothing I leave is going to be anything like where I go. A lot of times I just think, man, you know, boy, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I love life. I love living. I've got a good one. I just, I, I tell people all the time, you know, I just think that God just gave me the best life that anyone's ever had. I just, God's been really good to me. My life is wonderful. I enjoy living it. But friend, it pales in comparison with the things that the eye hasn't seen, the ear hasn't heard, and the heart hasn't imagined. God has greater things for those. And so, oftentimes we as believers are faced with this struggle of trying to hold on to life. I don't know how many people that are dear ones to me that have gone on. They've gone to heaven to be with the Lord. And uh, oftentimes I think I wish they could be here for something. <coughs> Often thinks I, I, wish, I wish they could see this. I wish, and, I, and then as I reflect and I ponder, I think, but they don't wish that. The only reason I wish they could be here is because I'm not wishing I could be there. Because if I were there, I'd think I never want to go back. You know, I mean, honest, well, I better be careful. I'm not going to illustrate that one. But, you know, some places that I've been, I've thought are pretty good until I go to a better place. And when I get to the better place, I never want to go back. Uh, I hope my family doesn't get offended by this one, but I never want to move back to Kansas. To Kansas. <laughs> yeah, Kansas. That's not funny. <laughs> no, you know why I don't want to move back to Kansas? Because I like where I'm at. I like where I live. Now, I like to visit Kansas. I can do things there I can't do here. But uh, I don't want to live there anymore because I'd rather live in Florida. Florida. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather. So, the reality of it is that if I ever get, if I ever get to be with the Lord, I'll never want to be in a sin-cursed body on a sin-cursed earth. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? Okay, now, in context, though, when we talk about people loving this life, we're talking about people loving this life. Loving this life. The Bible says a person that loves this life is going to lose it. Is that true? Has anyone ever been the exception to that? No, everybody that's loved this life has lost it. And then whoever wants to save it, uh, is, is, or whoever loses his life is going to find it. And what he's going to find is life. Now, then the illustration, or the... the the, the thing that illustrates the value of eternal life. And by the way, this is if you're sharing the gospel with someone, this is a good question to ask someone. What's your soul worth? What is the value of your soul? Because the scripture tells us the, world's, the world has nothing in it that is worth the value of your soul. And yet every day individuals make the decision, don't they? To trade something for their soul. Now, I'm not talking about specifically selling their soul, like saying, you know, I'm... I, I, I'm giving my soul to something. You can't give your soul to anyone but God. God is the owner of your soul. Uh, there are a lot, there's a lot of nonsense misnomers about that. But the reality of it is that many individuals sell their soul for something far less valuable than what it's worth. You know, I, in, a, in a small sense, when Esau traded his birthright, it's a good example of that. And really, literally, uh, that was exactly what Esau was trading. If you think about it, um, Esau, his father, Isaac, was wealthy, right? He was pretty wealthy, and Abram was pretty wealthy. But the truth of the matter is, is that they weren't ridiculously wealthy. In other words, they were great men. They were powerful men, but they weren't the most great or powerful men in the world. And so a lot of times when we think of Esau selling his birthright, we think of it in terms of inheritance. We think of it in terms of land, or um, goats, or uh, <laughs> uh, servants and possessions, wealth, possessions. <coughs> but no, Esau's birthright wasn't wealth or possessions. It was the promise of God had made to Abraham and Isaac. That was the birthright. And Esau profaned it. He despised it. Didn't care about the spiritual blessing. Do you think Jacob inherited all of his father's wealth? 
pretty sure Esau inherited it all. So what was it that Esau despised? Well, he he despised his soul. He despised eternal things, spiritual things. It's a good question to ask somebody, what is your eternal life worth? What's your soul worth? What's the value of it? And Jesus' answer here to the, to the question was, there's nothing in the world. The entire world isn't worth what your soul is worth. Your soul has more value than that. Okay, so now let's look at a couple of answers then for verse 28. Uh, we see rewards in verse 27, but verse 28, Jesus said, Verily. And any time the word verily is used, I'm glad it is. Because, you know, uh, the translators of, of our Bibles, they knew the word truly. Did you know that? They knew what the word truly meant. But the, when the word verily is used, it's a special emphasis. In other words, it's a very true, a very truth. Uh, it's, an, it's an idea of, it, it, it has a force behind it that says, this is so true, it cannot be untrue. In other words, this is one of those just always true things. You ever known something to be true in most situations, but not always true? Well, a verily truth is always true. It's a, uh, it's a what a, <laughs> what a Shia Muslim would call a truism. Okay, but it's one of these things that's just a, it's a, it's a great truth. It's a God-sourced truth, if you will. I better take the Shia Muslim out because Shia Muslims don't use the word verily, but they have an idea. They use like to use the word truism. Uh, but so here Jesus said verily I say unto you and when he said that his disciples would have said whoa you ever had somebody say now listen up pay attention now and when they do it gets your attention and when Jesus said verily I say unto you he's been talking to his disciples about things that were so important that they became the eternal word of God so the topic the things that he's saying, really almost word for word, they remembered to the word that he said them in. But then he said, Verily I say unto you, and if you were there, you'd be sitting up and listening. You'd be like, okay, he's making a point. He's telling us what this all means. He says, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Well, let's analyze that statement. How many of you guys have the 12 disciples memorized? All right, Mrs. Price. She can give us Simon Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Thomas, Matthew, Simon, uh, son of Zelotus, uh, Thaddeus, Judas, Judas Iscariot. There's two more. Let's see. Uh, Bartholomew. And Did I say Philip? Bartholomew. Mm -hmm. I said Thaddeus, didn't I? Mm -hmm. Anyway. Well, here they all are. Here each of them are. Let's let's just go through them. Which of those which of those are still alive today? Which ones? Well, none of them are. Okay, now, do you think maybe there's a discrepancy either in their understanding of what Jesus said, or a discrepancy in what Jesus said, as in he said something that didn't come true? Are you all Bible believers? Do you believe that God's Word is true? Mm -hmm. I am. I'm, conv I'm convinced. I, you don't, there's no convincing me. I'm not one of these guys who believes the Bible has errors in it. Mm -hmm. So when I see something like this, it makes me say, well, what is Jesus talking about here? What's being said here? Because it, it begs a good question, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, we could agree that this certainly uh, is, has either been true or will be true, then, couldn't we? This evening. Either has been true or will be true. Well... In each of the accounts, the next event is the Mount of Transfiguration, mm -hmm. where they saw Jesus Christ in His glorified body. And so, uh, it certainly is true that when Jesus was in His glorified body and Moses and Elijah were there, Elias, were both there, if you read further down in the next chapter or the next several verses, that's the next account in each of these three Gospels. Certainly it's true that that would have been Christ in his kingdom. In other words, we could say that that would be a way that we could understand it, couldn't we? But it's interesting, uh, Jesus didn't say all of you, he said some of you. There be some here which shall not taste of. So we could say it could be Peter, James, and John, couldn't we? Mm -hmm. Peter, in his letter, the sec second Peter, he said, uh, We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. <coughs> and majesty certainly is a kingdom term, isn't it? It's a, a king term. Uh, you know, he talks about. 
no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private uh, interpretation. And so I will say to you this evening that I believe that the answer to not seeing or not tasting death would have been for the disciples. But let me ask you a very, very practical question this evening. It's included in three of the Gospels. Do you agree with 2 Timothy 3, 16? Knowing this first, and no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation. No, that's not just 2 Peter. I'm sorry. Uh, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable. Okay, if this is written for the benefit of Peter, James, or John, what's the profit? Life. For them? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that's the verses before this, but I'm talking about the profit of some of you are not going to taste death till you see Christ coming in His kingdom. Well, I'm glad you got to experience that, Peter. <laughs> Peter said, we have a more sure word of prophecy where until you do well to take heed. He's talking about the Scripture. And so Peter certainly wouldn't have said, you know, that, you know, this experience for me. Remember what he said, though, on the Mount of Transfiguration? Peter said, it's good for us to be here. And let's build tabernacles and let's stay here. You know, let's, let's profit by this. Let's be, do... Okay, so let me ask you a question. Do you think that the interpretation of Matthew 16 is that Peter, James, and John profited in a way that no one else in the world ever would? I actually don't think so, do you? In other words, I, I'm fine with someone saying, you know, I believe that the Mount of Transfiguration fulfills what Jesus said to His disciples that were all there, and others, other people, be, besides His disciples that were there. But I just think that maybe Jesus could have had a private conversation with Peter, James, and John and not waste everybody else's time. And I, I don't take this the wrong way, but we don't need it in the Gospel if it doesn't have anything for us in it. So if all Scripture is profitable, then there's got to be some profit for us in it. Now you say, Pastor, the Mount of Transfiguration is profitable for us. Yes, it is, because the Mount of Transfiguration illustrates to us God's, I mean, more than this, but it illustrates God's attitude toward inspiration and preservation. When Peter said, we were with him on the Holy Mount, and then he said, we have a more sure word of prophecy. He is saying that the Word of God is a better witness than someone who saw Christ in His glorified body. Mm -hmm. He said, I had this experience, and, this is a, and the Word of God is a better testimony than mine. Could it be written to us in the last generation before He comes, we will not taste death till we see Him come in His glory? Well, it could be written to us, but then that would exclude everybody from the actual people Jesus said some of you to and everybody in between. So, the root answer is no. <laughs> so, uh, but that would be the problem with, with simply interpreting that way, but you're not wrong. A prophetic reference, uh, maybe. Yes. Okay, so let's go to Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews, and then we'll end up in, in John. Uh, John, in John. Seems to break it down. He does, but did you, you don't make my conclusion from your Roman uh, message. <laughs> I have to go home early. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. I think I'm going to hug a tree while you guys are turning there. Can't seem to get it right. It's cold and then people come in and it's hot. Or somebody's temperature tampering around here. I don't know. Mike's not here. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you there? Tyrannical temperature tamperers. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2. And uh, let's go ahead and... Let's read beginning in verse 1. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard Him? Well, that's a little clue, isn't it? Confirmed to us by... Who, who confirmed those things by us that heard Him. Well, that would be the disciples, wouldn't it? would be them. Uh, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to His own will. And I believe that's speaking of Acts, the miracles by the disciples in Acts. That, that you know, the miracles Jesus did proved He was God, so that He had the right to die for sin. He didn't come to do miracles. The miracles He did proved that He was God. The disciples 
when they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they did supernatural things in the first century, it proved that they were true apostles of Jesus Christ, that they was the same power that Jesus Christ had that they were working in. And uh, so it confirmed that they were the ones that the Holy Spirit was using to pen Scripture as well. And that's why, my friend, we don't need miracles today. I'm not saying God doesn't do miracles today. I'm saying we don't need miracles today because God doesn't have anything to prove. He's given us His entire Word, and this book's proven. Anyone that will test it will find it to be true. Okay, so moving forward, in verse 5, he illustrates what we've been given in contrast with even the angels. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. Whereas we're going to be ruling the world to come. The angels are not going to. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. I wish I could preach through Hebrews. That's coming. Our series in Hebrews is coming soon. But I can't do it tonight. Notice verse 9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Now Jesus told the disciples, some of you standing here are not going to taste of death till the Son of Man come in His glory and His kingdom. But Hebrews says that Jesus, who made that promise to His disciples, tasted of death. Mm. Tasted of death. Mm. And here, I think, lies a simple explanation for our context. In other words, what Jesus is telling His disciples is that you need to take up your cross and you need to follow Me. And what He is illustrating is the worthiness the worthiness of our Savior. In other words, if you've been born again, my friend, you'll never taste death. Now the word taste is to sample or to try something. There is not a more appropriate word for individuals that try to teach that Jesus literally went into hell and uh, burned in hell for us. That isn't what the Scripture's teaching. He led captivity captive, uh, but He did not go to hell. But he tasted death, and death is separation. And separation is from God. Jesus in the context is talking to his disciples about following him and being worthy of him and having a reward from him. And then he promises them, he, or he illustrates the importance of losing a life so we could find it. Does it not occur to us that when Jesus is talking about a person certainly losing a life, that when He says you're not going to taste death, He's not talking about never physically dying? He's not saying my kingdom, Jesus Christ's kingdom did not come on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus Christ's kingdom is coming. And no one who's followed Jesus will ever be separated from God taste of death. Now some of those disciples would have tasted death. Judas. Judas tasted death. Didn't he? Some of those disciples forsook Jesus and fled and who knows? I don't know who are believers and who are not believers. God knows. You know the notion that because somebody faltered or fell, they're not saved. My friend, you want to play that game, you're playing a dangerous game. Because you will not qualify. Mm -hmm. You'll never be a good enough disciple mm -hmm. if discipleship is the requirement for salvation. But if you want to be a good disciple, you could lose this life and find it. And the consolation in losing this life is that you'll never die. You'll never taste of death. Or as Jesus concludes or he illustrates something to the disciples that I think ought to be really plain as the nose on our face. And that is that nothing you give up for Jesus, nothing you give up for Jesus is without a reward. And nothing that you give up for Jesus is not a great trade-in for the fact that we're never going to taste death. Jesus is talking here about his, about his cross. He's talking about persecution. 
He's speaking of, of uh, being tortured. He's speaking of uh, being mistreated for following Him. And when He speaks of this to His disciples, the promise is you won't taste death. You won't taste death. What is that death? Well, that would be the death, that separation from God. And while He is telling His disciple this, the irony of it is that He has just been speaking about His own death. Remember this? Let's go back to Matthew chapter 16, shall we? And we can look at it in each of the Gospels. Matthew chapter 16. Verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto His disciples how that He must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Jesus is the one who tasted death. You say, Pastor, we'll never be separated from God, but Jesus was. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in Jesus' statement that there will be some which will never taste death, there is the inherent understanding that He will so that we do not have to. And my friend, that's the urgency of discipleship. The urgency of discipleship is not worthiness, earning worth with God. The urgency of discipleship is Jesus tasted death so we don't have to. We don't have to what? Well, we don't have to taste death and we don't have to worry about this life. You will never sweat drops of blood in agony before you taste death. But Jesus did. Before He went to His cross, He cried out, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? Before that, He cried, Father, He prayed, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but Thine. In other words, He was willing to taste death. Friend, it is such a nutshell. It encapsulates it so well to understand that we love Him because He first loved us. We love Him because He first loved us. And so, I would say to you this evening from the Scripture, and I believe on the authority of Scripture, both what we have looked at in Hebrews as well as going back and just looking in our context in Matthew chapter 16, that when Jesus is telling His disciples that they will not face death, He's giving them comfort in knowing that anything you give up so that you don't lose your soul. Anything you give up, and by the way, that's not how you get saved. It's not how you save your soul. But anything you give up in this life is nothing. Because you'll never die. You'll never give up life. You can't lose your life. You cannot lose your life. You cannot lose your life. You know, sometimes repeating something over and over again helps us to believe it or to think it or at least to, to, to realize the truth enough to act on it. You cannot lose your life. You cannot lose you. You ever just had to tell yourself this isn't going to kill me before you do it? <laughs> huh? Yeah, you take medicine, you eat kale. I think kale will probably kill you. But you, you know, there's certain things that you do, you know, and you're like, this is not going to kill me. Man, I've made some things for my health that are just abominable. And I've just thought, you know what, this, and I have to say, no, it's not going to kill me. And I just choke it down. Just eat it. Whatever it is. And um, it helps to say, you know, it's not going to kill you. Just perspective helps, doesn't it? You know, Jesus has called us to be His disciples. If you're a believer, you're called to be a disciple. And, you know, if you study Matthew about discipleship, you would recognize the conclusion that every believer is called to be a disciple, but not every disciple is a believer. In other words, you can follow Jesus and not be a believer. But you can't really, anybody who's a believer naturally ought to follow. But you know, sometimes following Jesus, even for believers, is difficult because we're concerned about losing our life. We're concerned about something we're going to give up. I'm going to lose my hobby or my interest or the thing that I enjoy. I'm not going to get the most out of life or, or I'm not going to like the life that God wants me to live because I'm following Jesus. And my friend, the guarantee is that you'll never taste death. You can't lose your life. You cannot lose your life. You cannot lose your life. 
you'll never taste death. And then the reminder inherent in that is that Jesus did. He gave his life. He tasted death so he wouldn't have to. Is there anything too great for Jesus to call us to? Is there anything too much for us to surrender to? Is there anything that is too costly that we could not pay the cost? And the answer is Jesus paid the ultimate price, and so we don't have to be concerned. What's the worst thing that could happen? You ever ask yourself that question? What's the worst thing that could happen? For most people, it could kill me. That's the worst thing that could happen. And what Jesus is saying, follow me, can't kill you. Can't kill you. You can't be killed. It's great to be immortal, isn't it? I even think back to the practicality. I'm rambling a little bit now. I need to finish. I think back to the practicality of uh, preaching the gospel uh, at, at Pentecost in, in Jerusalem after the resurrection. It was quite a while before the first martyr. Quite a while before they killed the first Christian. Why do you suppose that was? Well, you wonder what's going to happen when you kill a guy and he comes back from the dead. Mm. <laughs> well, yeah, that's right. Man. They killed Jesus in three days. He said, you know, destroy this temple. And they knew what he said. They knew what he meant. Destroy this temple in three days. I'll raise it again. They set a guard over his tomb and the guard couldn't stop it. He came back. Now, can you imagine killing his disciples? I mean, what a mess. You know, you... When, it, when you start killing people and they come back from the dead, you've got a problem. It's, it's just, it's, things are going to be exacerbated. It's going to make you look pretty weak. The reality for believers, listen to me, the reality for believers now is that we won't taste death. And that ought to be pretty powerful, ought to have a pretty powerful effect in how we live, knowing we can't die. If you play video games, if you're a video gamer and you you know you have one of these uh, you know unlimited lives or invincibility, you play a little different, don't you? Walk out into the open and I don't really play video games, but you know you you just you play differently <coughs> when you can't die. Yeah, we as believers sometimes live as though we could die, mm. and we can't. And I believe that's the direct application and why the Holy Spirit wanted that to be in all three of Matthew, Mark, and Luke's accounts. Hey, you guys can't die. Small wonder when they really got it. Small wonder they all were just ready to die. Isn't it? You ever wonder, how could they have the courage to die? Well, because they knew they couldn't taste death. And neither can you, and neither can I, if you've received Jesus. That's what the world needs, isn't it? Real invincibility. Father, thank you so much tonight for what we've learned from the Scripture. And I just ask that the application of it could be practically lived by us as we boldly, not only preach the Gospel, but as we live our lives for Jesus. Help us not to see anything in this world that would be worth the loss of a soul for. Help us to see the value of it, and help us to see the value of what happened when you literally tasted death so that we did not have to. Thank you for what you've done for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for your attention tonight. I want to uh, go ahead and have a couple minutes. We'll take some prayer requests uh, before we dismiss.